There are 10 generations from Adam to Noah. There are 10 sections of Genesis that start with the Hebrew word Toledoth, usually translated as the genealogy or generation or history of. So section 1 of Genesis is the Toledoth of heaven and earth, then the genealogy of Adam, of Noah, of the sons of Noah, Shem, Terah, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, and the genealogy of Jacob. Let's jump straight into the genealogy of Adam. Chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam, the Toledoth of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Six times in this opening section of the genealogy of Adam, the word or name Adam is listed in Hebrew. I don't believe it's a coincidence that the number of times Adam appears aligns with the number of man. Six times. Although in most English translations... It only appears four times. Adam, man, was created on the sixth day. Adam is the name God gave to the first man. Adam simply means man or mankind in Hebrew. It also means red, strongly hinting at Adam's complexion, probably a mid-dark coloured brown reddish. And we have reconfirmed in this section that mankind was made in the likeness of God and were blessed by God. In verse 3, we have Adam at age 130 having a son, Seth, to replace Abel whom Cain slew, strongly suggesting to us the murder of Abel happened soon before the conception and birth of Seth. So it's all but certain the population of humans by this time had increased exponentially, probably Hundreds of people alive. The way this sequence is written is very particular, very precise, very meticulous. It's as if God is predicting the 21st century latter-day scoffers who laugh at the age given of these early men. Humans can't live for centuries. Well-meaning Christians seek to harmonise the atheistic timelines with the biblical account. They say, of course... There are large gaps in the genealogies which allow for humans to have existed on earth for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of years. But the precision of Moses' writing does not allow for tens or hundreds of thousands or millions of years. Moses' genealogies are intentionally exclusionist in function and construction. The way Moses constructs these sequences does not allow for gaps in the genealogy. By way of comparison, Matthew's genealogy is not exclusionist. It's possible, given Matthew's construction, that his genealogy skips some generations. And this is in fact confirmed by closer analysis. Matthew intentionally skips some generations to collect the names into groups of seven. When you carefully add up The Bible timelines from Genesis 5 and 11 in particular. Remember, both these chapters are constructed such that they exclude the possibility of missing generations. When you do the calculations, humans have only existed for 6,000 odd years. By my calculations, creation occurred at 4,223 BC. In fact, an additional 20 years needs to be added for a rounding down factor used in scripture on 40 occasions. So my best guesstimate of the creation date is 4,243 BC. The planet Earth is not billions of years old. It's a little over 6,000 years old. The missing, made-up, atheistic billions of years are a fairy tale told by the God-haters. You'll not find the missing billions of years in the Bible. As they aren't missing, they're make-believe. Adam was 130 years old at Seth's birth. He lived 800 years after the birth of Seth. 
And if you add 130 to 800, you get the total number of Adam's years. 930 years. What an incredible innings, as we like to say here in Australia. Imagine the knowledge he would have accumulated in this span of life. Imagine the wisdom of a 930-year-old man. Verse 6. Seth lived 105 years, and he begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. I've known numerous older godly men, well into their 80s, men who had spent the majority of their lives following Jesus, men who studied the word diligently, Men respected for their knowledge and faithful service to God. But such men would be considered little more than boys, young adults, lads, compared to a man like Seth, spanning 912 colossal years. By the time of his death, he would have had tens of thousands of living relatives. You'd need a football stadium to cope with the volume of people to take a complete family picture of Seth by the time of the end of his life. Imagine the wisdom you would accumulate over nine centuries of living. Imagine the skill set you could collect. Begin to comprehend the life experiences, the lessons learned, the volume of knowledge compiled. Think of the types of inventions you could come up with and refine, improve upon over this type of deep time. If we spend 20 years in an industry, we're considered a veteran. To them, our veterans would still be in their apprenticeship years. Verse 9. Enosh lived 90 years and he begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Men began to call on the name of the Lord during the 905 years span of the life of Enosh, we're told in Genesis 4.26. It appears Enosh was a noble man, a godly man, a man who appears to have led a revival in his community, a man from whose line would ultimately come the Messiah. When Enosh arrived, men began to call on the name of the Lord. This isn't stating that prior to Enosh no one worshipped God, we know they did. But it suggests Enosh was a great man who influenced others widely to call on the name of the Lord. We need men like Enosh today to stand up for Christ, to stand up for truth, to stand up for righteousness, to stand against the growing tide of evil and perversion. We need men today full of the power of God, full of the Holy Spirit, mighty men of God, meek men, men committed to the teaching of the word. Men who encourage others to call on the name of the Lord. Lord, we pray, send men like this to Sydney so we can see revival, so Sydney can hear and receive Christ's gospel truth and hear the word of God. Verse 12. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel, one of my favourite names. After he begot Mahalalel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. The lingering question stands, how is it that these early men lived for centuries, but now most people struggle to hit triple figures, even with the intervention of modern medicine? A hint is given in the narrative of chapter 1. God repeatedly says everything he created was good. And finally, he declares his entire creation not just as good, but very good. I think this indicates the genetic makeup was originally faultless. No copying errors, no mutations in the original DNA. God made mankind to live forever with the added assistance of the tree of life as the fountain of youth. Originally, the human body wasn't intended to wear out. After multiple decades, eyesight didn't start failing like it does now by the time we get to about age 50. 
Knees, hips, ankles and shoulders and teeth didn't need replacing after a few decades of hard use. Skin didn't grow soft and brittle and arthritis didn't take hold by the time you hit your 60s. Menopause didn't fall on women in their 40s and 50s. Perhaps not till their 400s or 500s. Perhaps there was no menopause at all originally. The age spans rapidly start to fall off after the flood. By the time we get to about 30 generations after creation, the time of the Exodus, the time of the giving of the law at Sinai, human lifespan more or less was equal to 21st century expectations. All the modern cancers, diseases and human ailments are a consequence of approximately 200 generations. That's how many generations since Adam we are at now, approximately 200 generations. And it's those 200 generations of build-up of mutations and genetic copying errors. The specific genetic coding for super-extended long life gradually fading away during those first 30 generations. It also seems a specific judgment of God after the flood to intentionally shorten the lifespan of humans. Additionally, the conditions after the flood were also probably less conducive to long life. Perhaps the life-sustaining and healing capacity of plant life degraded after the flood. The firmament, no longer in place, no longer filtering the more harmful effects from the sun. Combined with the dramatic narrowing of the gene pool to just three human breeding couples, assisting to focus and amplify the effects of the first 11 generations of genetic mutations. Let's read on, verse 15. Mahalalel lived 65 years and he begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years and he died. In an attempt to explain away the multi-centuries lifespans, some well-meaning Bible interpreters have postulated perhaps an accidental corruption of the original documents. Rather than years, maybe we should be reading these ages in months. So, Mahalalel's 895 years reduces to a more believable 74 years and 7 months. That seems like a reasonable solution to the long ages, don't you agree? Well, yes. Till we start the conversion to the age of fatherhood. Mahalalel would have been five years and five months old when his son was born, conceiving at four years and eight months. All of a sudden, we're in trouble. (laughs) An important detail I've learned when studying Scripture, when we make a little compromise with one Scripture in order to smooth out what seems, according to the prevailing wisdom of the day, some rough edges in the biblical text, This compromise in interpretation can cascade into a series of bigger ramifications to other connected scriptures. Never alter the scriptures in an attempt to harmonize the details with secular historical prevailing views. Never do it. Eventually, the secular history may catch up with the biblical truth. I can guarantee you, secular history clashes with Bible history It's the secular history that's wrong. We'll pick up at verse 18 in our next study. May God richly bless you.